What we're asking for is to be viewed and treated as fully human. That's all we want. We want to be viewed and treated as fully human. Welcome to Mentoring Kings. Where do we go from here? A look at social justice in America. Moms of Black Boys United is a nationwide coalition of moms of black boys and men of all ages. Um, we came together first in the summer of 2016 and we have a goal of influencing both policies and perceptions that impact how black boys and men are treated and perceived by law enforcement and in society. So as I mentioned, we started the summer of 2016. If you remember, that was a summer um, of back-to-back -back killings of black men, specifically Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge and Philando Castile in Minnesota. And I'm a mom of two young black boys. At the time, they were seven and four. And seeing those cases and the graphic images, my spirit was just broken and crushed. And I started a Facebook group um, four moms of black boys and men and only sent it to about 30 friends and it took off and grew virally that day from 30 people to more than 21,000 within about 12 hours. So I always say that it's an organization that I started accidentally. I wasn't really trying to start an organization. I was just trying to connect with other moms who could understand what I was going through in that moment and who could um, share in the moment of, you know, grief and pain and confusion and anger and so many emotions that I had that day that obviously a lot of other people were having too. I will say the first day I was just overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by um, how it just took off. I didn't. I knew so little about starting Facebook groups that I didn't even understand when I started it that people could add other people or ask people to join. So all of that was news to me and I just saw it growing you know, within five minutes to 500, then 1,000, then 2,000, then 4,000, then 7,000 dinner time, 15,000 and 21,000. And I just felt overwhelmed. But then someone in the group, I think on the very first day posted, you know, we need to get on a call. We need to plan a march and put together a conference call for 7.30 uh, Saturday morning. So two days later, and you know, I got on the call and there were moms from all around the country and just hearing everyone speak, um, I decided to form a steering committee from the women who were on that initial call. And I didn't know these people. So keep in mind, these are strangers but I'm just listening to who's saying what and who I thought had good insights. And I formed a steering committee from those people. And then we were together every Saturday from that point forward that summer planning and strategizing. And one of the things I said on the very first call is, you know, I don't really want to plan a march. Like there've been a lot of marches. What I want to plan is a long-term strategy on how we go about um, solving this issue holistically. So by the second call, which was one week later, I developed a mission statement, um, our five point approach that we still use today and within a couple of months, we decided to form a 501c3, which is Moms of Black Boys United, and a 501c4, which is Mob United for Social Change, which is the advocacy arm where we speak out on legislation and all of that. And we were incorporated very quickly and got our IRS, you know, certification. Uh, but it happened very quickly, but it happened because of the passion and determination of those moms who came together with me that summer and spent hours, well into the night, many days, strategizing on how we were going to go about this and how we would structure an actual organization. Before we started, there were so many cases, you know, I, I was thinking about this all the way back to Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Eric Garner and Sean Bell and Amadou Diallo, like so many who came before them. And then as soon as we started, there were many more that came after, like Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Stephon Clark, Antoine Rose, Jordan Edwards. Um, and all of those cases are cases where we, um, spoke out. So our approach is to um, mobilize moms to speak out um, in public forums at the local, state, and federal level and to speak out on specific cases. So depending on, on what the situation is, we will either be speaking out for a piece of legislation like um, the Sandra Bland Act in Texas, or there was a whole package of criminal justice reform bills in Louisiana. There was Raise the Age, which passed in New York, and we were very vocal on all of those or um, we're mobilizing around a specific case and we're asking for whatever is needed that time, whether it's for the video to be released, for an independent investigator to be appointed, for the person to be arrested or charged. So, and looking at our history, the last time I checked, and this was sometime last year, we had spoken out on more than, I think, 67 cases since our inception. And that's just, this happened since we started, right? So it's been fascinating for me to see people's reaction to the George Floyd case uh, because there have been so many who came before him, um, and I, it's just 
curious to me, like, what was it about this case? And I think there were a few things about this particular case that got people's attention. One, I think it's because we're in the middle of a pandemic and you can get people's attention in a different way because so many people are at home and don't have a choice but to focus on what's right in front of them. They're not going about their usual routine of their daily busy lives. So I think that's definitely a factor. But the other thing I will say is I, I haven't felt um, the way I felt in the summer of 2016 um, and you know, in 2014 with Eric Garner's death since until now. Like when I saw the George Floyd video, one, I delayed watching it because I knew it was gonna be traumatic. I try not to even watch all the videos anymore, but eventually I felt like I had to watch it because I needed to write a statement on behalf of the organization about it. And the reaction I had to that was very much what I felt um, in 2016. So I feel like the world is having the same experience that I had then where I just felt paralyzed and highly motivated to make a difference and try to act. So I'm very encouraged um, by all of the activity around it. And I think the, from my perspective, one of the most significant things that's come out of it that we're now getting behind in a big way is the Justice and Policing Act in Congress um, that was introduced, the Democratic bill, because we've been studying these issues for four years. We've been going to Capitol Hill, we've been going to state capitals, and almost everything that we've talked about and research in terms of what would possibly move the needle is in that bill. And it's the most comprehensive piece of legislation I've seen introduced. Um, it includes things like banning the chokehold, um, which was obviously an issue in the most recent case, um, banning no-knock warrants. Um, it also um, limits the, the amount of force that police officers are allowed to use. It takes it from what's, um, you know, what you could do to what's necessary. So what's the necessary use of force in this case? It provides a continuum for the use of force, which is very significant because there are a lot of things that police officers can do currently under policy. So you'll hear often after these cases say, well, he was within the policy. So, but was that necessary? Did you have to shoot the man, you know, in the parking lot at Wendy's who was just sitting in his car drunk? No, you didn't. You just chose to do that. It might be within the policy, but it wasn't necessary. So it provides those kind of provisions. Also, very significantly, it would create a national database of, um, that creates a record of police misconduct. So officers who have been involved in um, you know, civilian shootings and um, sh shooting or choking, whatever the case may be, unarmed citizens, there would be a record of that. Because what often happens, too, is that these bad officers who have these very spotty records just go from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, you know, re-traumatizing communities. I think that was the case. Um, with Tamir Rice, an officer who killed him. You'll see that many of these officers have a history. Also with George Floyd, that officer had a history of abuse. So there would be a public record of that. Those are just a few things. Um, also, um, local law enforcement, they have a lot of military equipment that's been funneled to them. It would prevent them from getting so much high-powered artillery, which is significant as well. Um, so it really approaches it almost from every angle in terms of training. So folks in on de-escalation training, um, Implicit bias training, it focuses on policy, what they can and cannot do differently, it focuses on accountability. When they do mess up, where's the accountability? And making sure that there's a record of their, their wrongdoing. The term black on black, you only hear the term black on black crime, right? But if you look at any race of people, people, people commit crimes most often against people who look like them. So if you look at stats for like, you know, who are the perpetrators and victims of white crime, there's white on white crime, there's Asian on Asian crime, there's Latino on Latino crime, there's black on black crime. Overwhelmingly, people commit crimes against people who are close to them um, and who they know. So I, I kind of, first of all, reject um, the concept of black on black crime. Beyond that though, we know that when there is black on black crime, when there's a black perpetrator and black victim, those people are sought after, they're held accountable, they're arrested, they're put in jail. I mean, that's the whole plan for us to all be in prison, right? So mass incarceration is driven by uh, them going out and targeting and arresting, whether right or wrong, um, people of color, and especially black men. So um, there's accountability there is the point. The issue is when there's a law enforcement officer who looks at our sons just walking down the street, minding their own business, and they decide because they've decided that, you know, the cell phone is in his hand as a gun or, you know, the Skittles are a gun or whatever they're carrying looks like a gun to them, right? Whether it's something or nothing, um, there's nothing we can do to defend ourselves against that, against that negative perception. And 
to date, there's been no accountability. So you go back to all the cases, whether it's Eric Garner or Tamir Rice or Trayvon Martin, time after time, we've seen um, officers or people pretending to be officers, like in the case of George Zimmer Zimmerman, murder our sons and be set free. That's not the case in black on black crime. People murder people and they get charged and they get put in jail for long periods of time or they get the death penalty. But with officers, we've seen too many cases of no accountability. So that's why it's not really fair or accurate to compare those two things because what happens in those situations is very different. So what we're asking for is accountability from the people who have sworn to protect and serve us. We haven't sworn to protect and serve the community or protect each other, although we should. That's a whole different conversation. These people have signed up as their job, as their profession to protect and serve. And when they harm unarmed innocent citizens, that's the opposite of what they vow to do and what their job is supposed to be. And there needs to be accountability for that. You know, our organization started out um, because of police brutality and un unjust justified use of excessive force. Um, but what we quickly pivoted to is a broader view of the entire black male experience because what we see over and over again is, you know, it really starts in the schools. So there's, I'm sure you've heard the term the school to prison pipeline, which is very real. Like our children are being targeted at very young ages as being criminals or potential criminals. And, you know, many of us have heard the stat that, um, you know, if you look at third grade reading scores of black boys, that's how they project the prison, um, the prison beds that they'll need. Like if you can't read by the third grade, they have a prison bed waiting for you and they don't just have it waiting for you. They're building it, they're paying for it. Somebody's making money off of it. So there's a whole for-profit prison complex that drives all of this. Um, and it starts in schools where they often have um, over disciplining of, of black boys and increasingly girls as well. They are, um, suspended more often, they're disciplined more harshly for the exact same behaviors that their white counterparts do. They will be suspended, they'll be put out of school, they'll be labeled, and they'll be funneled um, through school resource officers through the juvenile system, which leads to them having a record, which leads to them being in the adult system. So um, the schools have definitely failed our children in that regard. You know, before you even get to what's happening in terms of actual learning and the images they see and whether the curriculum is culturally relevant, like it's failed them by targeting them and viewing them as a threat. Um, and we're seeing that it's even younger. And now we see um, there's data around even the preschool to prison pipeline. So as early as three, our children are being labeled as aggressive and out of control and in need of a special education just for having the same type of typical behaviors that another two or three year old might have. I think mentoring is very important, uh, particularly for Young black men, you know, we know the stat that at this point, 70% um, of black children are growing up without a father in the household. Most of our households are led by women. So I think um, it's very important for young men to have male role models who they can uh, relate to, who they can express their um, unique fears and interests and concerns to, and who can expose them to um, just different ways of living and different different possibilities. Like people aspire to be what they see and if they don't see it, if any of us don't see it, it's, it's hard for us to imagine it. I mean, I, I decided to pursue a career in journalism initially because my eighth grade English teacher wrote on one of my papers that he thought I would be good at broadcast journalism. But for somebody saying that, that wouldn't have popped into my, 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 my mind. But the thing is, it was something I could see because I could turn on the TV and see people doing it so I knew what it meant but if people only see people you know playing basketball and trying to make it to the NBA or trying to be a rapper or or um, being a drug dealer whatever it may be in their community who are the revered people and role models um, they will have a limited view of, of themselves and the possibility and I think mentoring can uh, fill a real gap in that regard in terms of exposing people to all different types of professions different types of lifestyles different types of family models um, and just different ways of thinking about how to approach life. Although many people are in single parent households that are female dominated, that doesn't always mean the father is absent. It means he doesn't live in the home. So there are many instances where the father is very present and active in the child's life, but just doesn't live there. And that statistic isn't reflected in the 70%. Also, we know that our men have been targeted, um, as I just said, since birth to be profiled, to be arrested, to be put through the criminal justice system. So many of them are either in jail or have um, records that maybe they do or don't deserve 
um, and can't really contribute meaningfully to a family and coming out of that situation or even not coming out of the situation don't have access to the same employment opportunities and income generating opportunities that would make for a healthy, productive family. And ultimately it goes back to slavery when our families were torn apart and the psychological trauma and generational trauma that comes from that. So I think it's important to put these things in a historical context, but all of that aside, um, obviously having a father in the home is important. Obviously having, you know, kids need as much support as they can get wherever it's coming from, honestly. Um, I mean, I um, am married and I have two sons and I can't even imagine being on this journey alone because it's, it's a lot and it's stressful and just to have, you know, be able to divide and conquer the responsibilities so that all of the stress and responsibility of raising children isn't on one parent is one thing and that's not just financial it's just the emotional support the mental support so i would just say to those young fathers even if you don't feel like you can support the family financially or whatever way you think maybe a man is supposed to do that doesn't mean that your presence isn't also needed and valued be there for your child love your child talk to them let them know that um they were not a mistake or something that um you didn't want to happen because so many children are scarred because you know, the mom will have a baby and decide to move forward, then the man disappears, either because they had a conversation about it or not. And children are left feeling inadequate and feeling unworthy because someone has, in their minds, rejected them and decided they're not worth worth the time and investment. So I think I would just encourage young fathers to, to be there in whatever way you can, just be there. What we're asking for is to be viewed and treated as fully human. That's all we want. We want to be viewed and treated as fully human. I think all of this stems from us being viewed as subhuman. We were brought here as slaves. We were treated as chattel. We were counted as three-fifths of a person. And that legacy remains today. So whenever people are looking at us, and I would say Black males are the primary target of this negative perception, they don't see us as fully human. So they don't feel our pain. When they, I mean, how many of these videos have people watched before George Floyd, like the boy, the 12 year old boy getting shot didn't move you like the man getting choked to death for selling cigarettes didn't move you like how many different versions of this do you need to see before you're moved so that's the thing that just bothers me the most that like what does it take like how many videos but I think it's because they don't see us as fully human and they don't feel our pain so from there it would go to you know stop profiling us in school stop targeting us um unfairly on the street, stop brutalizing us, stop killing us, stop um, choking. I mean, that you can go from there, but it all goes back to dehumanization and not being viewed as fully human. If you can get past that, then I think a lot of things would change. So to learn more about Moms of Black Boys United and Mob United for Social Change, please visit our website. It's mobunited.org. That's M-O-B-B united.org. If you're a mom of a black boy or a primary caretaker, you can sign up to be a member. Um, if you are just a, a supporter who cares about these causes, causes, please subscribe. You'll have an opportunity to subscribe to get on our e-blast list. Also, please follow us on social media. On Facebook, we're Moms of Black Boys United and Mom United for Social Change. We have public pages. We have a private group, Moms of Black Boys United, just for Moms of Black Boys and Men. We're also on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter at Mom United. Thank you for tuning in to Mentoring Kings. Where do we go from here? To learn more about future episodes, visit www.mentoringking.com and join the conversation on social media by following and liking at Mentoring King on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.